Hey guys, how's it going? This is uh, Levi Gates, and I don't have Dane, so I'm not doing the hello, 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 hello. Welcome to a detox. Uh, this is a detox cast, uh, basically our normal TRC podcast, but with detailing dignitaries here in the studio. And with me around the horn, why don't you guys just go around and introduce yourselves? I'm Dave Phillips. I'm the chemical and operations manager at PNS Sales. Hey, hey. I'm Bob Eichelberg, president of Flex North America. All right. And I'm Rennie Doyle. I'm a detailer. There we go. So we got a murderer's row here. It's a pretty good <laughs> setup right there. <laughs> I like These it. are always the fun ones. We do some of these when we go on the road and we get a group of us and we're just hanging out in someone's hotel room and we'll do a podcast uh, or people come visit. We try and get everybody in here. It's kind of fun, but we all just get to talk. It's a it's, cool room. Thank you. It's, it's a really fun cool. room, right? feel like you're in a radio studio you do it's like wow <laughs> this is detailing base pretty impressive well and we we also wanted to put a light on the outside that like would flash so oh, yeah. air you know be fun yeah, yeah. something kind of silly dang you never know but you guys are here we've had uh you came in this you all got here yesterday Randy. you've been here for a couple of days you've yeah. been going yeah. up north yeah we went in the sawtooth with my 14 year old yeah. daughter did some mountaineering that's that fun was pretty cool got a pedicure i saw got a pedicure yeah you know mm. here's the deal the 14 year old daughter said hey if i'm gonna go mountaineering with you you're having a petty with me there Cal you go california Safe. guy you know what dads do what dads do <laughs> that's right and i'll do it that's i'm okay awesome. with that she, she can have we'll have petties all she wants as long as she keeps going and ventures with me yeah yeah well it looks like you guys had fun and there was snow up there what? already yeah we got into uh you know we planned this a couple months ago yeah and we said hey i'll take you up let's go your first she's done a lot of uh, for those that don't know, I'm an, uh, a mountaineer, uh, and I do search and rescue uh, on the side. And then my uh, side job is I'm in the military reserve, and I actually train search and rescue. So really into mountains, uh, yeah. really into mountaineering. And so this is the youngest one, and she's been mountaineering with me for about four or five years. But this was her first time to go big mountain, Rocky Mountains. Yeah. And uh, we... <laughs> We had a little bit of snow come in that we didn't plan on, so we got up to about 10, 10, 10, 11, uh, 10 thousand feet, got into some snow, and by eleven thousand feet, it was up halfway to her calf. <laughs> so we missed our mark of our, our target by about a mile, but we had a good time. And uh, you know, it, I think you know where we're going to go today is my thing is you got to you got to get out and experience life. Yeah. And I like to put things. Dave's much the same way. We kind of like to put not really put it on the edge, but compared to what some people. It, they think we're goofy for going and doing that, right? Most you know? of them. Yeah, so we like to ski hard and play yeah. hard and mountaineer hard. And, and uh, for me, it makes business easier. When I come yeah. back, business ain't tough. Gives well, you a good perspective. It does. On what you really need. Well, and it shows you the spiritual side of things. You know, yeah. when you get up there, it's pretty evident there's a God. Yeah. And I ain't him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you'd like, even though you'd like to think too. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. You, know? you know, I am the boss of my house yeah. until my wife Diane gets home. Yeah. <laughs> You know, then she's boss. Yeah, yeah. I think that's how most of us are. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and then when my daughters get home, they're boss too. <laughs> yeah. So I go pretty far down the uh, the food chain. I manage right now with my son to still be boss, but there you go. You know, I'm probably going to lose that pretty soon yeah, too. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, uh, this is your first time in Idaho. First time. What a great city. Um, I compare it to my where I live, Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. Friendly people. Great clean. atmosphere, clean. Yeah, clean um, air. <laughs> clean air, yeah. I mean, it, I'm having a great time, yeah. and I'll be back. Oh, good. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> and then, Dave, we, we we did the podcast yesterday. You got to yeah. come hang out with us for a little bit. I drove you through downtown. Right. So right. you got to see it. I brought him down Capitol. Ah, oh, right on. I got oh, a little got feel for the town and stuff. Yeah. And we, we described it because you've been here so long. I went like, oh, yeah. Well, I went to school in Davis. Yep. And your uncle was yeah. in Davis. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like there's a lot of synergy there between the two towns where they're located, what you can do. Yeah, it's very similar uh, with the river, the ma or at least the mountains being so close, the foothills right. so close. Um, our ski resort's 15 miles up. Uh, it's not too bad. No. So you got a world class ski resort, an hour and yeah. a half, two hours yeah. away, Sun Valley. Yeah, exactly. You that know? whole area is gorgeous. Oh, it was. Um, that's where we were, and it was. Uh, you know, our daughter was born here. Yeah. In Idaho, two of our two of our daughters, two of our four kids were all born in Idaho, and uh, ironically, all of them have announced want to come back. They're coming back. You know, <laughs> it's an amazing. It's an amazing state and it's an amazing area. Yeah, you know, it really. Well, is. we're just happy to have you guys here, but we wanted to kind of just talk. So all you guys listening, I've got, like I said, I got, I got. Dave from PNS, I got Bob from Flex, and I got Rennie sitting here. So 
This is just kind of, you know, we get to hang out. And, and we've got Levi. All of us have got Levi hey, sitting in front of that. us. That's always fun. I mean, that's, that's so, he's the cool. He's the seeing cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. One of the fun things we were talking about, we were trying to figure out topics and stuff, and this is one thing that I, uh, you and I kind of hold this very serious and near and dear to us. Because um, we both kind of had that, you kind of ha- you have to work for it. We've had to put in a lot of hours. We've had to put in a lot of blood and a lot of sweat, a lot right. of tears. But the term master. Oh, yeah. And in detailing or yeah. anything like that. And the way I came at it is uh, I read a book, Malcolm Gladwell's book, mm-hmm. and it was uh, it's called Outliers. And it's it was about 10,000 hours. Yeah. And it was you put 10,000 hours into becoming a master. And I was reading that book when I opened my shop. And I thought back. And I looked at that and I said, okay, so applying this to myself, how long have I been in the detail industry? At the time, I'd been in it for 13 years. And I broke that down into an hourly time period and went back and just kind of guesstimated and saw. And I thought, I've exceeded that 10,000 hour mark. I've, okay, technically I've got the skills. A car could come into my shop and I knew what I needed to do to address it. I knew every single thing that was wrong with it. I knew instantly how I could fix it. And there wasn't much that surprised me. Right. I knew what tools I had and what equipment I had. I was still learning new techniques, new, new equipment, new polishers, new, new chemicals, all that stuff. But I knew that if that car came in, it could leave with the stuff I had and be perfect. And that was why I named my shop Masters of Shine. Mm-hmm. And my instagram handle was the master of shine my instagram tags is master of shine that's that's why it was that because i thought i'm pretty good at mastering shine wow that was my reasoning for it and then i saw lots of stuff where people were like oh you can't be a master if you're still learning right oh okay (laughs) master never stops learning right right that's how i got but it got kind of contentious there's a lot of there's a lot of blowback behind that but i never understood the reason why so many people took it so serious, like didn't take it serious. They, they almost like poo pooed it. And I thought, right. no, this is a trade. This is a trade just like any other trade, whether you're an electrician, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a journeyman of, of any type of uh, skill, you start out as an apprentice, then a journeyman, then a master. Absolutely. Right? That's, Absolutely. That's how it works. And, and they do that even to all the way up. Like it doesn't matter the trade. Stonemason, any of that kind of stuff. Here's something interesting you mentioned that. So I did a a case study. I'm very passionate about this, and I think it's a a shame that detailers... It's showing, really, when people poo-poo that, really what it's showing is how novice our industry is. Right. Because here's why. Uh, I spoke to a master electrician, my brother, and he's he's 20-plus years, as as 30-plus years now. God, we're getting old. Um, as a master electrician, uh, he went through a four-year apprenticeship, okay? Then he, he, he was a journeyman mm-hmm. and went through all the ranks. From there, I spoke with a master plumber, my cousin. Mm-hmm. He's an entrepreneur, also a contractor. From there, we, I spoke to not just one, but a couple master chefs. Now, all these people are entrepreneurs by chance, too. Yeah. Then, from there, I spoke with a military reservist. I talked to a, a master sergeant. Yeah. Okay, so there's another master, and the list keeps going on. We we I talked to uh, these people of industry. So we've got tradesmen like ourselves, which detailing, like you just said, is a trade, just much like electrical or anything else. Yep. And it's kind of a combination if you take a chef, mm-hmm. or if you take an electrician or something else. Is we're doing something that's kind of artsy, but it does take skill. Does that make yeah. sense? Yep. Here's the rundown now, and there's many more I talked to, many industries. That wasn't it, but that was. The, the ones that impressed me the most with their with their answers. Uh, first off, to be an electrical, uh, to, to be a, a union electrician, which they've got the, 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 the most intense training program, or a union plumber, it's a four-year apprenticeship right, right off the start. Yeah. Now, everybody that I talked to that are craftsmen uh, said the same thing. When you come out of your apprenticeship, all that says is you've got the base information down. You're yeah. able to, to, to go out on the job and perform what the average entry-level journeyman starts. Right. That's four years into it. 
Now, what these entrepreneurs added in is the, the apprenticeship program to really learn your baseline is about that, three or four years mm -hmm. to really learn their base. And I said, okay, what about when you're a journeyman? And they said, that's where it really gets interesting because it's gonna take you about 10 years to really be a well-rounded journeyman where you can go out and do anything that you need to do, yeah. where they can call on you. If you're gonna be a top level uh, electrician, plumber, cook, or a master sergeant in the military is that commitment's about 10 years is you got your you've got your fresh you know your freshman season which is your apprenticeship program four years and then your sophomore season is up to seven to ten years before you're really really well rounded now where it changes for us Levi and you just hit on something is you spent 10,000 hours but was that 10,000 you're an entrepreneur too correct yeah so had did you master both in those 10,000 hours or no, just one? just one. See? So there's where a lot of people get confused because when you bring in the element, the most, the most demanding thing that we have within when you're going to own a detailing company yeah. is the business. Yeah, and I, I don't want us to be too much of just you and me going back and forth, but, the, but I think that fits for any skill level. I think, Bob, how long have you been selling tools? Oh, two year, two or three years. Yeah, just a few. Yeah, just a yeah. few. Yeah. Since but you're 14. You, but you look at like how much knowledge you have in the in the tool industry in and of itself. Well, you after know, all these years, it's kind of like I was telling um, Jeff at lunch. I said I talked to my son who has a business in Omaha, and many times I'll give him some advice and he'll roll his eyes. Yeah. And I finally said, Steve, I'm not telling you this because I'm the smartest guy in the world. I'm telling you this because I've experienced it. It's happened to me. And if you cannot make the same mistake, far be it. You've learned something. Yeah. So it's the same in our in, in my industry. I've been so, I've been in this business for 40 years. Yeah. And I've, you know, we talked about at lunch the big customers of yesterday that aren't here today. Yeah. Everything has changed. Full circle. Hell, when I started, uh, the big show of the year was the National Hardware Show. Yeah. It was in Chicago, McCormick Place, once a year. You showed all your new products there. You held them the show in that April. Well, in today's world, there's no doing that because <clears throat> all these people want to know in advance. August is too late for Christmas and Black Friday and Blessed Thursday and Holy Monday and whatever else we have in there. Yeah. Um, so the, the the whole thing has changed. The whole ambiance has changed. But to Rennie's point, too, it's the same in every part of the industry that you're in. There's master people in the industries. You've got people that are rookies that aren't maybe journeymen yet. Then you have the journeymen who have served some, some you know, a few years with the company. And in my line of work, unfortunately, most people go on to another company. Yeah. You know, the, the people like my father yeah. working for the railroad for 47 years and retiring is gone. Yeah. I mean, people start with a company today, they go on to another company. It's like myself, I've had, I've worked for uh, five different companies in my 40 years of working. Yeah. So you experience something, you learn a lot, and then you move on and use those techniques somewhere else. So yeah. I, I think that um, you know being a master speaks obviously to your experience, but one of the things you've experienced is you've experienced a lot of failures. Oh you've yeah, seen a that's lot of it. mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so I have a friend. I'm not a pilot, but I have a friend that's a really good pilot, and I he sits around with pilots, and I get to listen sometimes. And you know, one time they were having a conversation where. You know, a new pilot will see a mistake happen. I'll go like, oh, how did that happen? That's ridiculous. And, you know, the other pilots around the table go, hmm, it happens. Because they've seen it happen. Right. Yeah. You know, they've seen the all the all the things that can happen, all the errors and or, you know, conditions that could cause something to go wrong. And they go, yeah, sometimes things go wrong. And I, I would say, you know, for myself, not only did I grow up in a detailing family, I grew up in a boating family. And... You know, I mean, there's so many, you know, rookie boaters out there, people buying boats and, you know, they they just don't have the experience. And uh, once you've done a lot of boating and I've done a lot of boating, I've been a raft guide. I've been a water skier my entire life. I know how to um, sail. A, a, I've raced small boat sailing. I've, you know, leased and rented large boats. So I've done a lot of boating and I've seen a lot of mistakes. I've seen a lot yeah. of things happen over that time. And you go, you know, and so at, at the end of the day, you just understand uh, and you're prepared. You're ready. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah, you see a mistake. You don't panic at it. You you know how to, you know, change your your uh, 
approach and yeah. and fix it. Well, and for me, the way I saw it was um, I had all these hours under my belt and I've been in the 110 degree shop in the middle of summer hmm. detailing a car and having sweat dripping off my face and onto the surfaces that I'm wiping. I've been in the freezing cold watching products freeze on the door panels because I'm stuck outside working on a car and or finishing up something for a customer and they're picking it up. Or, you know, I've hit a bumper that has new paint on it and taken it off with my rotary. Yep. You know, I've been in these situations. I've been hit with, I've had a rotary jump and bite me in the face, you know, and hit me in the head or, you know, come out of my hands or whatever. I've, you know, I've had all those issues and, but I always knew how to handle every type of car that came through. And I had, when I teach my guys at my shop and I teach new employees or I, you know, show them how to work and stuff, there would be those questions. And in the way I trained and the way I taught, they, I still get these to this day. People ask, uh, I'm having a really hard time. I can't get past, you know, I, I'm not making any money. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. And part of it is just having that knowledge and going, I know exactly what you're talking about. Dead. I know exactly the type of paint you're working on. I know exactly the type of car you're working on. And I know what's getting you stuck. Or I'd hear other podcasts from some of the other greats and they'd go, yeah, I'd, I ask them what the pad combination and what product they're using. And I have such a vast database. It's a, I joke that to my wife that it's a weird superpower that won't realistically <laughs> save anyone from a burning <laughs> fire <laughs> or make me a million dollars, but it's, it's just something but I, I have. know it, but I know it. And it's just trying to win a, someone texts me at midnight i usually have an answer for them right or if i don't i'm not too big or egocentric to go well i don't know what to tell you i can say why don't you reach out to this person they know more than i do on this and i think that means a lot of it too is being humble enough to i don't have the answers of everything but i can hopefully point you in the right direction and get you that assistance or that help. And I think that is a big part of that level too. It is. And one of the cool things that I always thought was neat about the, like the detail mafia is their level and their ability to certify in their, their organization with a master level you know, certificate. That's, that's the same kind of thing. I mean, it's, it is. it's, they're putting in time. They're, they're jumping through the hope hoops and they're putting in the number of hours. Well, Need it. I'll, I'll share with the listeners something that I did in the early days. Uh, we ran a really successful shop, mm -hmm. series of shops, and our best shop was right here in little old Idaho, yep. doing over a million dollars a year. We had our own certification program, and the top level that you could ever reach, I mean, we must have employed 60, 70 people. You yeah. know, the turnover and, and detailing is pretty... Pretty high. Pretty high. So we, we employed a lot of people. There's only three people that ever made it to master. Mm -hmm. The reason why we did that is we marketed. This be before IDA came or way before. Yeah. Is Here's the deal. If being a master, a true master, and having somebody else give you that title is a marketable piece of information that can turn into profits for you. It gives security to your client base. We made ours legit. It was written out. Any customer could see. We showcased it yep. in our newsletters. We showcased it on our website of what the different levels were and why you wanted to deal with us and yeah. why a master was on every job that we performed. Yeah. And it was a marketable piece. And now, now we can go out and get that from a completely different. Diane and I run, we've got a training next week for wonderful people coming through. Uh, we're not going to just sign off and give them our title is when they get done if they've if they've completed the work which we put them through a, a very it's it's at the ID level and then quite a bit so they'll be certified underneath us but we also give them their international recognition through the IDA yeah as recognized trainers that value until we as an industry start recognize that in bulk it doesn't need to be everybody because we'll never bring everybody on. Yeah. Detailing's too cheap to get into, and there's always going to be the bottom feeders. Yeah. But for those that really care, and if you want to, if you're not thinking like a 
it's going to be I was I was going to go off course. If you're not if you're thinking like an entrepreneur and like a professional, you're going to take and realize that marketing yourself at, at what you are, you can't call yourself a master in my mind. I never called myself a master. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of weird because the, the the detail mafia you mentioned that we're we're our voting in our masters right now. Yeah. The uh, Diane and I don't have a voting right. We have a nomination right only. Then the masters vote them in, and here's the criteria: they got to know what they're doing. They've got to be very good. More than that, so is they've got to have you know if they're nominated to be a master, their skill base is really quite advanced. Yeah. But here's what we want them to do: the masters want is they want to see them with a successful business making profits and they want to see them living a lifestyle. It's it's easy to succeed if all you do is work. Yeah. If you can't real success is when you have real balance. Yeah. And so we won't name our masters in the mafia masters unless they have that balance. And and here's the other thing. We've also recognized the IDA. They have to be IDA certified and they have to be ambassadors helping to build up not just our team of, of mafia members we want them to be detailing industry ambassadors. Yeah, we want them to spread some of their knowledge uh, and their time and give back. Basically, and give back. Yeah. Huh. And so, you know, Dave, I'd love to ask Dave a question. Mm -hmm. So you go through. I mean, UC Davis right. graduate, right? Yep. You graduate with a degree in chemistry. Actually, it's biology. Okay, biology. So how, you get out of school. I mean. How long before you, like, you thought you probably knew what you're doing, right? You get out of school. When, when did you really realize? When was the aha moment that you go, okay, I thought it was smart then. I finally arrived. You know, there's still always surprises, you know? <laughs> Bead maker. <laughs> well, no, no. <laughs> there's, there's surprise success. There's also surprise, you know, failures. Right. Um, but I would say maybe five years ago, I started feeling like, you know, people – I could I could approach a product and go I know exactly what I want to do. Wow! And yeah. so, how long after school, if you don't mind me asking, without oh, that revealing? would be thirty years. Okay, is that cool? Now here, can I? I'm going to share one more story without so, hogging the mic. Oh well, just, I, you know I don't get to spend you know eight hours a day in my formulating right. with my formulating hat. I get to spend a couple hours a day. So when you add those all up, right. you know it takes yeah. a long time to get uh, to that ten thousand hours. But I. I, I think that number is pretty darn spot on. You know, you need to have tried a lot of different things. And when I, it's so funny when I look at the number of lab batches that I've done, because I obviously have records for every single one, it's like, wow, there's yeah. a lot. That's cool. I never thought of that. A lab batch of all the, so we know you for. And how many, wait, so how many of those lab batches were successful? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a true story. Uh, SEMA, we're going back, we're talking about how 10, Ten years ago, there's no yeah. detailers. I was with Bob. Mm -hmm. we, we, it was the first year I'd ever worked with them at the booth, just helping him out a little, and I was so excited. I thought I'd arrived, man. I was, I was working a booth, right? Yeah. And and Flex was really the first one to give me uh, shell oil, and Flex was it. Yeah. You know. <sighs> we go walking around, and oops, did my mic or did your mic go off? I think your mic went off. Uh oh. I wonder if they can hear me still. Mm, yep. No, your mic's still off. Tim, can you hear us? Huh. There it goes. Oh, it goes. Hey, back on. So we go, I, I take a little break and we're walking around the show and Carol Shelby comes walking out of mm -hmm. a booth by himself. And we're like, oh, that's Carol Shelby, yeah. you know? And Rod looks at me, my buddy, and I look at him and I say, dude, we got to go and talk to him. He's by himself. We're never going to get this opportunity again. So I'm, I'm probably about 30, this is probably 13 years ago, 14 yeah. years ago. And um, he, uh, we walk up to him. We were really nervous. He was really nice. We introduced ourselves. We, you know, kissed his butt you know because he's carol shelby yeah so i said hey you know I'm, I'm reaching 40 at this point you know which back then i thought was getting pretty old now that no. i'm not w well, over 50 i'm 38 yeah i'll be 40 or 39 it, in february it, <laughs> yeah so you're thinking about it right I'm right there yeah levi you'll be okay yeah All you'll right. be okay yeah. so especially after you hear what carol shelby told me so i told him i said you know mr shelby i'm reaching an age where i'm i'm really kind of concerned i want to i want to take a new avenue for my career and he looks at me and he goes, son, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm going to be 40 here shortly. And he goes, puts his hand on his shoulder. He goes, son, you're still retarded. <laughs> <laughs> he says, let me tell you something. Yeah. And he says, when, you're, when you've turned 40, um, you're just starting to settle down for most people. This isn't for everybody, but for most people. And he goes, son, when you hit 50, you're going to be in your prime. When you hit 60, you're going to be in your prime and making some money. 
when you hit 70, you're going to wish you were 50. And you know what? Carol Shelby was right. Is the 40s, the 30s and 40s were my building years. I, I did well, yeah. right? He did well. You know, Shelby Automotive, I think he did pretty well. But tying that all in to your ability and profitizing. When you're in business, it's all what it's about. Yeah. You know, it really is. But all too many times, entrepreneurs tie that into the amount of hours they work. And you've got to stop. The generation, the greatest generation in the world, the baby boomers, the guys that fought World War II were my idols. Yeah. They didn't know how to not work. Yeah. That's where I took my cue. It has taken completely reprogramming programming myself to now every every second or third week I, I work a four day work week. And my goal is to keep doing that. You know? When I was younger, I met somebody really interesting that really taught me that. And then I met somebody that destroyed that and I went back to a really poor work habit, which was overworking. Listen, if you're smart and you really plan well and you execute execute your plan, you don't need to overwork. Yeah. You really don't. And the Europeans see that better than us. Oh. You know what? They're very effective. We spent Bob and I spent a lot of time in, in, in Europe working. And you know, they they're they're very focal around their, their lifestyle. They 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 concentrate on their lifestyle. A lot of them think Americans are nuts. And you know, we are because we trade our time endlessly yeah. and we, we dive in at things and we don't calculate how much time we're spending and wasting and then calling it success. There's a lot of people in small business, service businesses, AKA detailers, right now that are all over online bragging about how many hours they put in. Yeah, taking pictures of their watches yeah. while they're still at the and studio working. There's times shop. I want to grab them by the neck if they're a parent and say, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. What, I'm not proud of that. Don't be proud of that. Be proud of saying the, the really successful guy is the guy that comes in at eight and leaves at four Yeah. and uh, is smiling about it. You know that's the guy, because you know where he is? He's at the bank making deposits while the other guys are taking and sweating it out and trying to figure out how they're going to make it. Well, and, and that was my thing, too. Like, I had to learn, you know, I had a boss that would push and push and push. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're cold, work harder. If you're, you know, if you if you aren't making enough money, work harder. Like, we got cars. And that's how I grew up. And my dad was like that. And my dad was a, my dad still is a 60-hour-a-day guy mm -hmm. and then has a side job on the weekends where he has some wow. rental properties. So wow. he's still, he's 63 and that's, or 64, just la the other day. And that's what he does. Right. He's busy a lot. And his goal is next year I'm retiring and I'm done. And I'm going to just, I'll have time for everything. And that's kind of like, I see that as an extreme. It is. But it's it helped raise me to a certain way. But with my kids, my biggest thing at my shop when I started it, and I laughed because my investors were two car dealership guys. Oh. And they were like, so what are the hours of the shop? And when I started, I said 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Closed on the weekends. And he was like, they were like, what? the car lot's open from 10 to 8. Mm -hmm. and open on Saturdays. We're closed on Sunday. And I said, yeah, that's great. Shops 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. That's it. And they were so confused by that. But that's how I ran it. And that's how my guys ran it. And my guys, it was, hey, guys, if we want to come in at 5 a.m. and work till 2 so we can all get off early on Friday, let's do that. Let's do it. If you want to come in, any of my employees, you want to come in at 5 and go, let's. that's cool, too. And the guys would do that and so it's one of those things where you just try and our biggest thing was let's take the time to be home absolutely and have a life because it detailing can burn you up and it can burn your brain out and so the whole goal is to try and keep you know keep your life centered and then i got little kids like i blink and they're they're next you know they're they're gonna be old they're four and seven it's exactly that you know and so it's being able to be home and spend time with them. Like I, my wife and I joke that, and it's not a joke, but it's, if I come home and I'm on my phone, I get in trouble. Good for her. Because for her, she goes, you're on your phone all day. Like that's your life. She goes, when you come home, you only have, from time you get home, it's usually five, I get home at 5.30. She goes, kids are in the bath at 7.30. By eight o'clock, we're doing bedtime. Wow. You got two hours a night with them. Two hours a night, five days a week to make the most of it with them. 
She goes, I don't want you on your phone. I don't want that. You know what? And I, it's hard. You know how I combated that when I was a young dad? And I've still got a 14 year old. She's here, right? But when, when my kids and my wife were young, what I'd do, whoa, yeah. whoa, hey, hey. I just spilled hey, some water. Does anybody have oh, a towel? Good. Does good. anybody have a towel? There uh, we go. We took and how we combated that was pretty simple. Is that when my kids were little, sorry, I'm going away from the mic That's just for right. a second just to clean up. We're going to dry off this yeah. table. Uh, so. How I, how I combated that, exactly what you said, it's not that hard. Yeah. What you do is when your kids go to bed, now it's your wife's turn to yep. have you. Yep. When your wife goes to bed, then you work for a couple hours. You pay yeah. for it. Don't make them pay for it. That's And that's what I do. I Good boy. I do my hardest Good to boy. turn my phone off or at least not look at my phone when we're watching TV that's or it. something. Um, you know, that's, that's I, don't, I don't know. I, well, easiest got, way I can do it. How do you guys do it? I'm, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I pretty much, you know, do the eight to five. Mm. Yeah. Um, when, <clears throat> excuse me. It's got a frog in his throat. I have a frog in my throat. So, um, I do the eight to five uh, when I, my kids were younger. I mean, when, when, when four fifteen happened, uh, I, I left work. That was what happened. So I came, you know, and I, my family has done a really good job of, um, separating work and, and, and life. Yeah. So I I don't really work when I go home. I I never have. That's but, awesome. Um, you know, I never have. I I mean, there are days. Well, you know, it's hard to turn our brains off. It's it's hard, right? Um, it's running in the back of my mind, and I'm thinking about it. But basically, when my children were younger, it was at 4:30. I, I had to be done with work, and I had to go home because, um, you know, I sometimes be the one picking up the kids or that sort of thing, and then I would have them for maybe by myself for an hour or two. On occasion when they were really young and then as they as they got older then my my wife kind of like took on some uh personal time so that she could be doing that but still i came home and and did it that way that's awesome yeah Bob? that's awesome oh boy <laughs> <laughs> well let me explain that the years that i've been in this industry keep in mind when i was your age you didn't have cell phones yeah Okay, so 5 o'clock at night when the office was closed, it was done. It was yeah. over until the next morning when you got to work and you yeah, had all your exactly. messages and everything else. Uh, back then, we had a reel-to-reel on the telephone, a recorder. Yeah. Hi, this is Bob. Leave your name, number, and phone number. I'll call you back tomorrow. Yeah. Now, today, I ha will have to admit I'm horrible because my kids are growing. My yeah. kids are gone. Um, I travel every, every week somewhere. Um, I pride myself on no emails at the end of the night before i go to bed and you know it's it's just the way it is today i don't know any different yeah but to all your but you were kind of you were lucky i had the sense. years when my kids were growing up it ended at five o'clock because you didn't have anything else we had yeah believe it or not most of the listeners here won't remember this we had sky pagers yeah. that was a pager that you had on you when you got on an yep. airplane and, and when you landed it would beep the number of beeps was a number and all it had was the phone numbers. Yeah. That was it. You didn't know who it was. You were you calling back. You didn't know who back. it was. No, you, but you'd call them back. And, or in the days, uh, Levi, let me ask you a question, being the youngest one in the crowd. When's the last time you used a pay phone? I was uh, 16. I'd gotten a okay. flat tire on my truck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Been a bit. Yeah. You know, in my world, back when I was your age, which wasn't that long ago, I mean, you went to the, you flew into O'Hare, or you flew into DIA or LAX. You immediately got in line with the 50 other people that were there and either used your uh, AT&T credit card number yep. or you started feeding coins into the deal. Yeah. And look at today. Those phones are all gone. Yeah. It's yeah. A goat, they're gone. Yeah. I remember going and visiting when I was younger, just playing in those yeah, <laughs> in the right? phone booths at the airport. <laughs> but to your point, um, you know, I was sitting with my wife, uh, you know, the last year or so and we were talking and. You know, you always remiss on saying, God, I could have done a better job. But like she always called it command performances. So when the kids had, my son was in the state wrestling tournament, I was there. Yeah. If he was in the hockey playoff, I was there. Yeah. I might not have been to every practice. But to your point earlier, <clears throat> make the best of the time you have. Yeah. Take time and do it. Right. You know, one of the, I, as, we're, as we're talking about this, one of the things I know... We used to mention, actually, at you know family dinners, we have a family business. Yeah. So mom's involved, my grandmother was involved, my dad, my brother, myself. Um, but we never talked business at, like, the dinner table or 
Um, of course, when we were really involved, we weren't living there, but at family occasions, Christmas, New Year's, uh, you know, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving uh, weekends up at, you know, up at the lake house, no business was ever, ever talked about. And, you know, if there were, if there were issues, we were just, it was completely separate, which I, I think was really a, a really nice thing that I learned. Yeah. I think that kind of helped me. Yeah, because you grew things. up in it. I grew up in it. I mean, it's so easy. You could spend all your life talking about business. Yeah. Um, and I think it was my parents that did that. They, I mean, they, the subject just never came up. It was like we were, it was, we were on, we were on the weekend now. We were boating. We were, you know, hanging out at the lake. We were sitting on the dock. There wasn't, there wasn't business. Well, I think this younger generation, let me, let me tell you my career in search and rescue and, and, and the military is unfortunately part of that. I've seen a lot of, of, um, of death and, and, and people in their worst. When I show up, uh, it's not a good day for you. It, it could be the worst day of your life or the last day of your life or the worst day of your family's life. Mm-hmm. The stress that I self-created from overworking way outweighs what I faced in search and rescue in the military. Which so, is saying a lot. Way. The stress I put on myself, the demands I put on myself, and what I caused, the damage I caused on emotional overload yeah. in my business have done more damage to me mentally and physically than the damage of seeing death. Yeah, That's not easy to admit because that was self-inflicted. Mm-hmm. I'm not proud of that I'm not because that was me. And you know what? Part of it was the way I grew up. It was survival. I thought that's what I had to do. Yeah. And again, the greatest generation, just like your dad, we were taught the only thing they knew. Yeah. That's just hard work, go to work, stop. We need to retrain ourselves a little bit mellow out and also as men we're conquerors yeah we're bring the money home you know hunt do all this stuff bring money bring food feed you know load the table we're going to keep our precious wife at home now you know what that was another thing i did that damaged myself it was good for my kids it was good for my wife and it wasn't so good for me yeah and that's my kids are here i'm not resentful towards my wife it was my idea yeah but what I am resentful for is that I wish I wouldn't have been so macho and admitted that it was hurting me yeah. earlier because I didn't admit that I had so much on my plate that I couldn't handle it. Yeah. And it damaged me. It damaged me. Now, I've been able to fix that, but I'll never get those time that those those moments or years back. Relatively fixed. Yeah. Relatively fixed. <laughs> yeah. Except for that little twerk, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's and I I think that's the hardest thing that a lot of these young guys seem to forget. And I try and and I try and use like what you just said, Bob, about like 20 years ago, like I, I remember in high school, I'd get home from school. I'd call a buddy. If he didn't answer the phone, I'd leave a message and then I'd go do something. Right. And I'd wait to get a phone call back. And now like, and it's just our industry and maybe it's just our, the, the society. I'll get texts from people at three o'clock in the afternoon and I will return them 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I'll get four or five texts in between there and say, hey, you haven't responded yet. Yeah. You've instant. seen it, but you haven't responded yet. What's I up? know you've read it. Yeah, I know no, you've read it. And I'm like, well, yeah, I saw it. Right. I will respond to you when I, I'm coming into, you know, I'm trying to finish up last few emails or whatever at work here. I'm getting ready to leave. I'm driving home, playing with my kids. And sometimes those those responses i will my phone will believe just light up and my wife's like your phone's going crazy what is it i'll find it and i will tell them family time i have a life i've got yeah uh, playing with my kids getting ready to do bath time i will talk to you when that's done and they're like oh yeah sorry yeah. forgot about that yeah and i try my hardest to ignore that stuff because i wish it was like back then i wish it just ended and i could come in the next morning and just and i've tried it I've tried to go like, I'm just not going to answer anybody's and I will do that first thing in the morning and we'll work at it. And to Dane's credit, he's done a really good job with our Facebook page. After five o'clock, if you message the Facebook page, it pops a thing up and it says, we're sorry. Everyone's gone home for the day. We'll get back to you at 9 a.m. I like that. Right. And, And it's an automatic message that pops up and it says, you know, you've reached us after hours. 
here's the thing. And I'm like, I just need to do that on my own personal. Can you, that's exactly uh, there, that's, are, there are do not disturb settings on, on texts and stuff. I wonder if they can be like, hey, I'll get back well, to you Well, it's later. Facebook Messenger, and uh, these guys aren't on Facebook Messenger, oh. so that's a good mm-hmm. thing. <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. right, yeah. For Renny and I, though, I've I look at that. I've been accused of that. <laughs> yeah, but for Renny and I, I look at that and go like, I should do that on my page. Like, just to put a, sorry, guys, can't we just, answer right now. We just did it. Yeah. Because... We got to a point where we're between between our, our, our social media sources and then my personal sources, it was over it's two to three hundred messages a day. Yeah. We did the math. It would take two full time people nine to ten hours a day just responding. Yeah. How the heck am I supposed to do that? Yeah. So we put an automatic send and if they're serious, they'll Even get a hold of us. We just say, Hey, due to the, the, the demands and the amount of volume, here's our phone number and here's our direct email. And if they don't use one of those they didn't need to talk in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And I hate to be like that, but it's gotten ridiculous. Because I'll get people that will send me a note, hey, hey, what? why did you use the white towel instead of the red towel? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, think, I remember the days when nobody knew who I was, and <laughs> um, I appreciate them reaching out, but really, why did I use the red towel or the white towel? That's it doesn't, the question. It doesn't matter. Yeah, and I get ones like that too. Yeah. And, it's, and I joke that sometimes I've been, right now, my biggest thing is if people write, I say yes or no. That's yeah. it. That's my answer. So if they go, they ask the question, they, I'm going to try and answer it with either a yes that's or it. a no. Mine's two words, speed maker. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> a, that's probably the easiest way to go. They don't answer all of them. But but that's what I do because- Third word's flex. Usually what happens is they go, oh, they, yeah, yep. they see it and they go, oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Real simple. Got it. Well, you know, to kind of come back around is, you know, this whole thing. I think you make, I think this whole master thing, it's make, it's what you make of it. I think so. And if you don't, I, I, you know, I see a lot of people taking a lot out of the detailing industry, but not wanting to put a lot back in. It's -hmm. the way that they feed themselves. They feed their family. They feed their ego. They feed their, every aspect of their life, yet they don't want to put anything back in. And that just... To me, well, is selfish. Well, and I, and go back to greatest gener- generation. All those folks that came back from war, still because they served, because they provided service and service for others, they reached out and joined service associations and service communities. Absolutely. If you think about it. How many of us, like my grandparents, were in the Elks? You know, they they were Continued lodge members. Give. Like they were doing things, and that was their social part of their life. Was that mm-hmm. was serving. And as detailers, the closest thing we have to that is the IDA. Yep. And it, it's cliche to say, but the great, a great man said it. And it's, don't ask what your country can do for you. What can you do for your country? It's exactly it. You know, it's the same with the IDA. What can you give? What can you do? What committee can you volunteer on? I'm the co-chair of the certification committee. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I do. We're reworking the certification tests. We're rewriting it. We're right. also creating a motorcycle exam as volunteers. As volunteers, I do this because I care about the industry. Well, the other, the other, in addition to that, people say you get more than you give. Yeah, boy, that's amen, Dave. If that ain't yeah. the truth, you know, it's it's you know, and Dave, we call him our silent killer. <laughs> uh, he is because Dave's you know one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. As is Bob. Yeah, you know. Uh, two different things. Just Dave's ability to take and talk to the common person as smart as he is, is not easy to master. Ha, huh, another master. <laughs> but he has. And you know what? He's got a great way of communicating. Bob's got a master's degree. He's ran, he's, he pushes more millions through the average year than most of us will do in a lifetime. Yeah. Yet he can be, he can speak and be spoken to and he's down to earth. Yeah. There's part of it, develop your personality, promote yourself, not over promote, promote yourself, get legitimately, there's so many options for getting certified these days. Yeah. Have somebody else call you a master. Yeah. Don't call your, here's the deal. I've got all these masters in the detail mafia. And the, and I'm like, what do I call myself? And they'll say, well, you're master. And I said, says who? I've never been voted on. They're like, oh, yeah. dang. And I was like, so I have no problem. I want to build you guys up. There's so many of those guys that are so far beyond me now. Uh, this is a secret conversation just between us, right? Because yeah. I don't want them no, to get No, we're not out. recording okay, this, yeah, yeah, just okay. so you know. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want a few of these guys to get a big head. But, you no, know, in reality, there's so many of them that can just absolutely 
uh, just beat up on me yeah. and and out and, and outperform me. Uh, and I'm proud to say it is because, and it's not because of age or anything else. It's because these guys, it's people that are sitting around this table right now. Our industry has changed, and so many people are giving so much yeah. that the new generation coming up right behind me is way better than I ever was at that point. Way better. And that's I'm not threatened by that. I'm yeah. blessed by that. That's well, awesome. And I want the next generation behind them to do it quicker, faster, and even be better. Yeah. It just means more growth for our industry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk out of this whole game at the very end. I take my last breath and go, hell yeah. Because you know what? I think that I've played a little tiny part in it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've helped people change their entire life around from overworking and realizing that. Why? Because, again, the stress that it cost me was unneeded. Yeah. It was silly. It was ego. And it was dumb. You don't, there's people you don't need to do that. There's too many smart, brilliant people around our industry today that can show you the right way and not work yourself to death. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself mentally. And we physically. And physically. And take care of your family. And you know what? Your business will take care of you. You're more. And go out and do things. Yeah. Don't be a bump on the log. This world has got, and it doesn't have people say, well, I don't have money for a vacation. That trip up into the Sawtooth the other day cost me like $4.50. Yeah. You know, go to the beach, walk along the foothills, go do something. If you don't like adventurous stuff, play chess, develop your mind. Anything that when you live, when you become addictive, to, when you're addicted to life, people become addicted to you. And, you know, I think, I think the other thing is you don't need to save up to get all the time. You no. can take a half hour a day. Right. If you've got right. a spot to go walk or you can just, you know, meditate or, you know, get off your phone, um, all that sort of stuff, you can take that time in little chunks and still get the value out of it in a half hour a day. Yeah. Well, you know what I like to do is I go, there's a junkyard across the street. Ah, you I would. Go, I go pay a dollar. There you go. Walk and then I go oh, wander that's through the junkyard. Idea. That's fun. That's and cool. And look for stuff. And just kind of, cool. it's, it's 30 minutes, 20 minutes, yeah. but it's, oh, it's a break. Yeah. yeah. Junk, I'm not thinking about anything zen. else. I love I that. like it. Finding stuff looking at stuff and it's not a nice like yeah. old school junkyard it's mid 80s and and up but it's just i like to go walk through and look at all the beat up busted cars and go well that's a nice hood or that's a good and quarter it, panel. it's almost like you know what happened to that car right yeah or who was right. in that car or yeah who, who owned that car not yeah 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 but where, i was like was finding weird story? stuff and go hey look at that that i haven't seen one of those in a while like so but it's something as simple as that it's even if if it's a lunch break yeah, you it's, know, it's huge. It's just, you know, it's funny because Jim Gogan, a uh, good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and, and Jim, we're sitting at a meeting one day with the mafia at uh, Mobile Tech, and there's probably 20, 25 of us sitting in the room, and some of the younger guys are going, "Man, how do I, how do I fit last minute cancellations? How do I fill that spot up?" And so I'm running through my formula in Diane's red, what's called a red dot formula. It's mm -hmm. really cool, something she developed on how to fill vacancies within your within your schedule when somebody does a no-show or doesn't show up. And I run through it, and I'm all excited about sharing it with these guys, and I'm smiling, and Jim goes, man, you guys are missing the boat. And I said, what? And he says, who says you got to fill that time with work? Why don't you go enjoy yourself? Yeah. And I went, oh, damn, I feel like an idiot, you know, because he was right. He says, every once in a while, treat yourself to you. Yeah. And I'll never forget that, you know, because it's – there's the other thing we do, especially as men. You girls well, do a better job. Us guys, we don't gift ourselves time. No, we don't get our nails. I had a pedicure yesterday, though. Yeah, that's right. But I had it, a pedicure with my daughter It's yesterday. powerful to be able to, even if you're running a shop, to be able to, if you have that time and you know, use that and just go, when the last car is done and you've got time, maybe m instead of cleaning the shop that day, that afternoon or something, just say, all right, guys, go home. We're out. We're done. Go. It and means a lot. And you guys go, I can't I can't deal with missing the money. You're getting paid. Go. Yeah. You're paid for the rest of the day. It's on me and go. You know how much loyalty that will build up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I do the same thing on like a Friday morning. Mm -hmm. I never scheduled retails on Friday. Right. I never scheduled a retail customer. And I only would do like some wholesale work here and there. But it was because I could control the feed for that day. Right. right. I could control the work. And so my guys, we'd all show up. They'd show up at 8 o'clock. I'd wait till everybody got in. And I'd go, all right, let's go. And we pile in one of my, I had a loaner Suburban that I don't, that I, that I used for customers. And we'd all pile in the Suburban and we'd head to a restaurant for breakfast. 
There you go. Oh, I like nice. it. And I'd buy him breakfast. And I was like, we're just going to go have breakfast this morning. And we'd do it once a month. And I wouldn't tell him what Friday it was or what when it was. It just, as soon as everybody got in, they were like, all right, so what, what do you want me to start on? I was like, no, we're all getting in Suburban. Oh, okay. And we'd go grab breakfast. And it was just something to break the monotony of the day. You know, I'll go back to, to taking and talking what Carol Shelby said. He, 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 he made one point that day at SEMA. And he goes, son, at 50, you're going you're gonna to learn what your priorities truly are. And he says, what you do is you stop chasing stupid money, go after smart money, and you don't kill yourself anymore. And, you know, the happiest point in my career is right now. It has been for the last probably 10 years. Yeah. Uh, I love running a shop. You know, I really loved it. But just like we were talking about Sears should have taken and, 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 and moved on some things, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we evolved. Yeah. And, and, and you as a detailing company, when you get certified master and you become a true master, you're going to have other opportunities jump up in front of you. Yeah. You witness, you're witness yeah. to that right now. All of us around this table are witness to that because we've all changed our business working with each other. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So the biggest thing that Carol Shelby said is you're going to realize what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Here, Why is the last 10, 12 years the happiest? Because not, I'm not putting too much pressure on myself. I'm taking breaks out of my schedule. We've had an intense, a tense. Bob you and guys, I yeah. have gone 27 months, you know, of, mm-hmm. of, of all of us going across the globe working hard, right? Bob yeah, and I, how many yeah. times have we been to Europe and overseas yeah. and Asia and everything else last? We're, we're taking a break, and, and we're not stopping, but we're using our momentum we created the last 27 months yeah. to carry us through the rest of the way, and now we're being really smart with it. But even during this working time of working that hard, <clears throat> I've taken, I've put holes in my schedule. We know when I ran a shop, Fridays were the most demanding, Mondays were the slowest. Yeah. So uh, now it's opposite. Mondays are most my, my most demanding day, and Fridays are my slowest. So guess what I do? Every other Friday, if I don't have to go in, and I'll say, man, I got this due. Is it going to change my life if I don't do it today? No. Take the day off. No. Yeah. Well, and I, I come back, when I come back from a trip, I usually always schedule the f- like a day or two, mm-hmm. and I'm just home. There you go, comp time. And it's like I'm I'm home. I'm hanging out with my kids. I'm doing stuff. My wife loves it because I'm home, and she's like, "Okay, good, because you've been gone for I'm gone this many days. <laughs> like I'm gonna go do this. I gotta run this errand. I gotta go." And I'm like, "Yeah, go ahead. Go, Fine. got it. Just enjoy it. I'm gonna hold it down for you. Me and the kids are gonna go do this. We're gonna go do that. That's it. And they look forward to it too because they get to do stuff with me and they haven't seen me in a while or whatever. And so it's been kind of a ritual that when I come back, I have this many, there's this many days. And, you know, with SEMA, that's our biggest trip for the year. You know, we're going to be in Vegas for almost 10 days. Right. And same kind of thing. I'm going on a three day trip with my wife and kids. I'm taking Friday off the week before we leave for SEMA. Dane said, well, you're really cutting it close there. I was like, mm-hmm. no, I've, we're not going to break down. We're not going to get stuck. Yeah, yeah. Like I know we're not going to be there. I'll be back on Monday. Like we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be fine. But as soon as we come back from from uh, uh, Las Vegas, my wife is going to be going to uh, after Thanksgiving. She's going to Disneyland with her sister. See, that's why you're you a know? master. And the whole goal of that is all my my goal is to have all my miles from all these trips, all right. my airline miles, all my points, is to just cover. A trip for my wife to go do whatever she wants with her sister forever, how that's long it. she wants. Oh, nice. That's all. That's all I want. That's that's. But out that's of this why you're a master. Go, because she needs it. Thank you. I appreciate because that. Because you know what, a master is well rounded, 360 degrees, and they realize it's not about all them. Yeah. It, and you know, it's not about bragging rights. It's not about just a bank account. It's about life. Because, you know, you. I'll talk to some somebody that's 30 years old right now. You're going to be my age over 50 in a snap. Oh, yeah. And if you overwork and work stupid, it's going to, it's even going to happen faster. Yeah. And it's going to deplete the years on earth you've got. And you, you know what? When you wake up and smell reality, it's going to be too late. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many times I've, I have never worked with a dying person that's ever said, please tell my work, I'm going to miss them yeah. and check in on my money for me in my bank account. Yeah. Never. Yeah, exactly. But you know what, when you're talking about a master, to sum it up, a master, whether it's a housewife, a chemist, you know, whatever, you're the best at what you do. Yeah. And you're looked at at being one of the best in what you do. 
You don't necessarily need a diploma. No. You don't necessarily need a title or a sheet of paper. But in your eyes or somebody else's eyes, how about your kids? Yeah. You're a master dad. Yeah. Oh, hey, amen. That means more than being wow. a master yep. detailer. Yeah. But that's it. Be a master at the time of what you do. Yeah. Maybe be a master at your life. That's right. That's exactly it. That's what it comes down to is it comes down to taking and mastering your life. Because, again, I've seen people in their weakest moment, the last breath taken, and they've never talked about work. Yeah. They always talk about their life, their loved ones. And the ones that go out in the right way aren't apologizing for anything. Yeah. They're saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to go. Now, where do you want to be when it's your last breath? You want to be apologizing for what you didn't do? Or do you want to say, hoorah, this was a ride and a half <laughs> until everybody else see him on the other side? There you go. Powerful stuff from powerful Rennie Doyle. Yeah. That was awesome, that. man. No, it was great. Thank you guys for being a part of this. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rennie. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, Bob, thank pl- you, Dave. Pleasure, Appreciate man. it. Thank you, Levi. Uh, as always, you guys can like, share, subscribe. Please, please leave a rating on iTunes. It means a lot to us. Leave a review. Like I said, I always joke that uh, just put awesome, great, thanks. But seriously, leave a review. It means a lot. It helps grow the channel. Share it with a friend, uh, you know, and uh, we appreciate everything that you guys do. Thanks for listening. Thanks to my guests. And uh, hope you guys enjoy it. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys. See you. Travel safe.